Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... As I mentioned in my previous video, this month I'm reserving my book reviews for books that have been recommended to me by the viewers. And this weekend I'm actually knocking out two birds with one stone, because not only am I reviewing a book that's been recommended to me, but St. Patrick's Day is right around the corner and the book I'm reviewing is by an Irish author. So before I get started on this review, I just want to say happy early St. Patrick's Day, and also remember to wear green because if not, there's there's one jerk out there who's gonna pinch you, and if you find an Irish person, be sure to kiss them. Of course, with their consent. And do keep in mind that if it is not of the Irish person's consent, we do know how to kick ass and we know how to drink. Speaking of which... Now I'm feeling a little more like my heritage. <coughs> If you know me, you know that a vampire book is like the last thing that I care to read. So you might be wondering exactly why I decided to do this book review for Carmela by Joseph Sheridan Lefanu. Well, one day, uh, pretty much this is how it all came about. Uh, one day, my good friend Antoinette and I, we were sitting on my back porch and we were discussing horror books over homemade Bloody Marys. And by the way, at this point, we were three sheets to the wind. And she's like, you have got to read Carmela. And I knew that this was a vampire book, so I just kind of, you know, tried to excuse myself from having to read it. And she could tell that I was not interested in this whatsoever. And so she kept on and she kept telling me some little fun bits about it that I'll review in the story behind the story segment. And I will admit that with what she told me about the story, it piqued my interest enough where I finally downloaded the book onto my e-reader. But even still, there was like a few months that passed before I actually decided to read it. And I had honestly never read Joseph Sheridan Lefanu before, so I had no clue what I was getting into. But uh, what I can say is I was really surprised by this piece of work. It was something that blew me away because it just felt so wonderfully gothic and brooding. And even though it is somewhat of a slow burner, there's enough going on from start to finish that just feels absolutely haunting. And even though I had never read Lefanu before, after reading this, I've decided I'm going to start checking out some more of his work. But... I do want to say, before I get into what you can expect from this book, I do want to say thank you, Antoinette, for recommending a vampire book to me that didn't suck, and I hope you enjoy this review. Although my copy of Carmilla is on ebook, it is also available in print and audio, so you do have quite a few options if you would like to get a copy of this. Now, with Carmilla, it is told in a first-person perspective by the narrator named Laura, and she's reflecting on a time when she was around six or seven years old, and her governess left her alone in her chamber, and while she was left alone, a strange lady crept into her bed and laid down beside her. And because of this lady's demeanor, Laura didn't really feel threatened. That was, of course, until this stranger started biting her, which caused Laura to scream, and in turn, it made everyone within the castle run into her chamber, and once they got in there, they discovered Laura was alone. Well, to calm her down, Laura's governess explains that this was just a figment of her imagination, and eventually Laura warms up to the idea that it was just a really bad dream. Well, you fast forward to all of these years later, and Laura's talking about how she's an older teenager at this time, and her father has received a letter from one of his friends by the name of General Spilstroff. And in the letter, General Spilstroff is explaining that he's going to be passing by their area in autumn, and he's hoping that perhaps the father can host him for an evening or two. And the general explains his mission is he's hunting down the killer of his niece. 
Well, as soon as this is learned, you have a carriage that crashes outside of their castle and everyone goes running outside to see what's going on. And they see a mother-daughter couple where the daughter's name is Carmilla. And even though the mother is conscious, her daughter is unconscious. And so she's freaking out that Carmilla's dead. But then when they discover that Carmilla is okay... The mother explains to Laura's father that she has to continue on with her journey, but Carmilla is in no shape to continue. So she asks if he can host her for the next few months as she continues her travels, and on her way back through, she'll pick up Carmilla and they'll just continue on. So with the father seeing that Carmilla is in fact in no form or shape to travel, he opens up his doors and says, of course she can stay with us. Well, in a very small amount of time, Laura and Carmilla form a tight bond, but that tight bond soon becomes very obsessive, especially with Carmilla towards Laura. And as things begin to get stranger and stranger, we learn that a village nearby where Laura lives is suddenly struck with a plague, and the plague is attacking young girls that are Laura's age. And as the body count builds up, Laura can't help but really focus on the fact that Carmilla looks exactly like the stranger who attacked her when she was a child. And as things become creepier, we start to wonder exactly who is Carmilla. Originally from 1871 through 1872, Carmilla was serialized in four installments in the London-based literary magazine The Dark Blue, but it was reprinted in Le Fanu's collection In a Glass Darkly, which hosts five of his most frightening works. Among these tales, each story is connected by the idea that they are case files compiled by Dr. Martin Hesselis. Due to Carmilla's publication date, this tale of dark romanticism predates Dracula by 26 years. However, Carmilla is not the first vampire story to receive publication, as The Vampire was published in 1819, and during 1845 through 1847, Varney the Vampire was published as a weekly penny dreadful. Nonetheless, Carmilla remains groundbreaking because not only does it feature Dr. Hesselis, who was literature's first occult detective, but it presents to readers the first lesbian vampire. Fun facts! Since I've never read Le Fanu before, I was really excited to research about his life as an author. And among the researches I did, here's a little bit of information I found out about his life. Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, who was considered the father of the English ghost story, was born into a literary family, and by the time he was 15, he shared his poetry among family members. However, due to his father being a strict Protestant clergyman of the Church of Ireland, Le Fanu avoided including his father among those who read his work. Education-wise, Joseph studied law in Dublin at Trinity College, but he eventually left that profession behind to contribute to journalism, which during this time he wrote stories for Dublin University magazine. Years later, after the death of his wife, Le Fanu expressed through journal entries his guilt and loss. Due to his grief, he withdrew from public eye, and this earned him the title The Invisible Prince. But at times, he could be seen in a local bookstore reading books on astrology and demonology. Now that we have that covered, it's time to move on to the spoiler section of this video, which this is where I'm going to discuss some scenes that could ruin the experience for you if you've never read this book before. If you prefer to skip this section, just scroll down to the comments and you'll notice that I have a pinned comment, and inside of that you'll see a timestamp where if you click it, it will redirect you to the thoughts section of this video. Now you only have 17 seconds to do this, so ready, set, Go. Now that everyone has had a chance to click away, I would like to talk about a few things that I'm still a little unclear about, and I'm sure that 
depending on who you are as a reader, you might draw a different conclusion to these subjects. So the subjects are very broad and there's really very little context that goes along with them. But the first subject I want to talk about is the moment when Laura confides in Carmilla about the experience she had as a child. And she tells Carmilla that the stranger who approached her bed looks just like Carmilla at this current age. Well, in response to that, Carmilla explains to Laura she had a similar experience, but the stranger who approached her bed looked exactly like Laura at this current age. Now, my thing is... Okay, so if Carmilla is telling the truth here, perhaps she received a vision of the last victim she would have when she became a vampire. So perhaps this was a vision she really did have when she was a human child. But we are seeing an example of fate that has brought the two together, and it's by fate that we are receiving these similar experiences. But... I also tend to think that Carmilla is just blatantly lying here, and I think the reason why she's lying about it is because she wants Laura to feel like they are connected and bonded by a psychic experience, and she uses this as her opportunity to manipulate Laura even further into trusting her. So that's what I tend to think, but I think different readers are going to see that differently, and they're going to have their own conclusions to it. Uh, another subject that I really want to bring up is when Carmilla explains to Laura that she sleeps with her chamber door locked because when she was a child and she and her family were sleeping, intruders broke in and attacked them. Well, here's what I'm left questioning. Okay, so did this really happen when she was a human child? Or did this happen after she became a vampire and she was perhaps hanging out with other vampires who she claimed to be was her family and the people who broke in and attacked them were actually vampire hunters? Or is this just a blatant lie so she can get away with being able to have a locked door so she can come and go as she pleases? Well, in my opinion, regardless of what the real case is, Carmilla does get her way and is able to sleep with her door locked where she can climb out through the window and kill people in the village and also terrorize Laura. So, again, there's not enough context here to know exactly what might have happened in Carmilla's past. Now, the final thing I want to touch on, and this was really a surprise here, but it's the moment when Laura and her father receive a package at their castle, and when they open it up, they discover it is a very old uh, portrait of one of Laura's ancestors on her mother's side. Well, due to the age of this portrait, we know it is much older than what Carmilla is. However, the subject that's in the portrait looks just like Carmilla at this current age. So this was really a surprise because I did not expect for Carmilla to be related to Laura. And in a sense, this almost kind of brings up the subject of incest, considering that there's like these strong lesbian vibes here. And also she's a distant relative of Laura. So kind of goes a little VC Andrews in a sense. Carmilla and her mother. These bitches. Okay, let me just set the stage here for these characters. They are some manipulative, conniving bitches if there ever had been any. And truth be it, I'm a little jealous because they're so damn good at their con. Now, the thing is, I honestly believe that everything they have done is a complete lie and it is all staged. Now, I do know for a fact that Carmilla was related to Laura, so there we go with that, but everything else was complete bullshit. And this is down to even the carriage having the incident in front of the castle. I honestly believe this whole incident was deliberately staged so Carmilla could work her ass into that castle, suck her way through the nearby village, and then suck the shit out of Laura, and then rinse, wash, repeat. So the carriage was honestly nothing more than just a Trojan horse, in my opinion. And just to show how crafty these bitches are, 
Like when General Spilstruff is talking about how he met Carmilla and her mom at the ball, pretty much like a similar story had been given to General Spilstruff. But the thing is, when he met Carmilla, her name was Malarker, which that is an anagram where if you rearrange the letters, it spells out Carmilla. And, you know, I wish I could do something like that with my name. I truly do, but with the letters and Alex, there's not too much to work with. However, if I did have two X's in my name, I could rearrange it and make my name X Lax. Carmilla is a haunting story that has a great payoff, and if you have a good imagination, that payoff is a million times better. Now, I do feel Carmilla is a great example of literature, and the reason why I say this is because even though we're provided with enough answers to satisfy us, there's still enough open context that allows the brain to fill in the blanks. And I think that if a group were to read this, there would be a really good discussion, especially on Carmilla's past and the relationship she has with Laura. Now, as far as character development is concerned, Carmilla is perhaps one of the most interesting characters in literature. And the reason why I say this is because of the whole lesbian vibe that comes along with her character. And I have to wonder, was Lefanu using this as an opportunity to demonize homosexuality? Or was he using this as an opportunity to comment on how people feared acting on their desires of same sex? Or perhaps, due to the time in which this was written, he simply just used taboo for taboo's sake. Now, regardless of why, the story definitely does show what a toxic relationship looks like. And by the way this is written, he doesn't just limit it to a same-sex relationship, but the qualities that you see in this toxic relationship can also expand out to opposite sex as well. Now, I do honestly believe that when Lefanu wrote this, he had no intention in demonizing homosexuality whatsoever. So I don't think that's the case. I don't believe he's bashing homosexuality at all. And the reason I say that is, if he was bashing homosexuality, he would reason in his story that vampires were created because a person who was attracted to the same sex had died. And he does not do that. But he does mention in his story that vampires are created from people who have committed suicide. So that's interesting. And as far as character goes, uh, especially like metaphorically, I really feel that Carmilla is the literal personification of a plague. And the reason why I say that is because she moves from village to village. She wipes out the weakest of the village, who just so happens to be females, which females were seen as weak as that time. And then she moves on to another location and destroys that as well. So um, that was really intriguing to see. And in the same aspect, I really do think that we see a spectrum of uh, submissive and dominant in the female gender in this story. And what I mean by that is we see the submissive victims of Carmilla, and we see Carmilla, who is a dominant individual who stands on her own. Even though I'm not into vampire stories, I was pleasantly surprised by Carmilla. And also, I felt that this was really a great gothic read. I mean, we had ruins, castles, tombs, the list continues, and it made it a perfect read for a gloomy day. Now, I do really have to compliment Lefanu on his style of writing, his pacing, character development, and also just the openness that he provides where there's enough given for the reader to be satisfied, but also at the same time it allows for there to be a discussion. And due to how he wrote, I really do feel that I'm going to read him again in the near future. So since this is the first time I've read him, I would honestly say this is a great first read, and I highly recommend this book. On to the questions. My first question is, what is a vampire book you would recommend for me to read? Now, I'm not looking for vampire romance. I don't want anything that's intended to be, like, 
for a stay-at-home soccer mom. And also, I'm not looking for vampire books where you have a vampire who joins hands with a witch and they go on a supernatural adventure. I'm not into that. I'm, I don't care about that. I don't care for the whole vampire mystery, suspense, romance, not my thing. What I am looking for is stories that feature vampires that are bloodthirsty, ruthless, demonized, and they run like hell at the first sight of sunlight they see. So load up my comments on that. Now, the second question is, do you believe in vampires? Now, as strange as what this sounds, yes, I do believe in vampires. Now, just hear me out. So, vampire covens do exist, and there is a vampiric lifestyle, and these people do live by a, sort, a certain um, code and moral, and I really do acknowledge that they exist, and I respect that they exist, but at the same time, they do not have the abilities that Hollywood has given them, such as these individuals, even though they identify as vampire, they cannot turn into animal or fog, they cannot live forever in a physical form, and they're not going to die if they encounter, like, a religious artifact or garlic or sunlight. So I do believe that there is a lifestyle for it, but I do not believe that they have any superhuman or supernatural qualities to them. Now, I do believe in psychic vampires 100%. And with psychic vampires, if you don't know what that is, like, let's say, for example, you are sitting next to an individual, and this individual is simply just draining all of your energy, and by the time you're done speaking with them, you walk away feeling drained, you just want to go home and sleep and just try to recuperate. And that individual walks away feeling fine. That's a great example of what a psychic vampire is. It's someone who drains your energy, then walks away with that energy energy. And the reason why I say I believe in that is because I work with a psychic vampire and I've had to like open up a protective bubble of energy just so she doesn't drain me every time I'm around her. So I do wholeheartedly believe in psychic vampires. So let me know your comment on that and just leave it in the comment section. I'll be happy to read it. And uh, now that I have everything covered, it's time that I wrap up this video, and I would like to say thank you to Lisa G., Joseph Baylot, and the author J.L. Mulvihill. Now that is J and L, such as the letters themselves, so uh, if you are interested in young adult steampunk or fantasy, that's what J.L. Mulvihill writes. So feel free to check out her work or hit her up online, and when you do, let her know Alex sent you. If you would like to contribute to my Patreon as well, just go to the description section of this video, and for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout-out, and if you are a creator, I'll do the same thing for you that I did for J.L. Mulvihill here. And also, I do have a new tier available that's $10 a month, and with this, you'll receive uh, one of my images at the beginning of each month, and as far as the image is concerned, I do photography on the side, so that's the image you'll receive is some of my photography. And then I'll continue to give you a shout out at the end of my videos. Now, if you're unable to do this, that's fine. Just come back and continue enjoying these videos. That's all I ask of you because this is done for the fun of it. That is it. And if you would like to connect with me on social media, I do have links to my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram all in the description section as well. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, be sure to subscribe and hit that notifications bell because I have tons of more book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a great happy St. Patrick's Day. Remember, wear green, don't drink too much, and if you do drink a lot, please have a responsible driver with you. So until we see each other again, sweet nightmares.